You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Coming up on today's programme, an energy plant classified as renewable, which receives hundreds of millions of pounds in subsidies, is Britain's biggest emitter of CO2, according to new analysis shared with Sky News. The UN classes access to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a human right. And Popeless, despite hopes he'd be attending, the Vatican confirms there'll be no papal presence in Glasgow for COP26. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and challenge those coming up with the solutions. New analysis shared with Sky News shows that a government-subsidised energy plant classed as renewable is the UK's largest single emitter of carbon dioxide. The Drax plant in Selby in North Yorkshire burns biomass pellets to generate electricity, for which it receives hundreds of millions of pounds in subsidies. But the UK and EU controversially both exclude biomass emissions from their CO2 totals. Well, data shared exclusively with Sky News has found that the plant emits 14.8 million tonnes of CO2 from burning mostly wood pellets to create electricity, which is classed as renewable. Now, that makes the plant the biggest single source of carbon dioxide in the UK. It's also the third highest emitting plant in Europe, higher even than some coal plants. But the UK excludes biomass emissions from its total count because, like the EU, it treats bioenergy as immediately carbon neutral. Now, that's based on the assumption that forest regrowth will soak up the carbon again. Well, Ember, which carried out the research, says it takes too long for bioenergy to become carbon neutral. They're relying on uh, the idea that the trees grow and that stores carbon and then they, they burn them and then that's that's all carbon neutral. Of course, what that doesn't take into account is the em enormous amount of time it takes for trees to grow. So uh, in restoring the forest, it could take 50 years, 100 years. Uh, and so when you take that into account, you're getting a huge pulse of emissions into the atmosphere right now. And then maybe 50, 100 years later, you're, you're reaching carbon neutrality. And obviously, that's not the time scale we need to, to tackle climate change. Well, Ember exclusively shared its report with our climate change reporter, Victoria Seabrook, who's here with me now. And Victoria, that point about timings is key, isn't it? Yes, that's at the very heart of the debate around biomass. Now, bear in mind that almost every country in the world has agreed that we need to cut our emissions to almost zero by 2050 if we're going to stave off the worst impacts of climate change. Now, that's only 30 years' time, less. So if we're waiting 40 or 100 years or more potentially to um, recapture this carbon dioxide that's released from burning biomass, well, a lot of scientists are saying that's time that we simply don't have when we need to be cutting emissions right now. And in fact, 500 scientists this year wrote to the EU asking it to stop classing biomass as carbon neutral. And they said that actually burning it is going to increase global warming and therefore it shouldn't be classed as renewable and it shouldn't qualify for these big subsidies. And they are big sums. So last year, Drax received more than £800 million from the government for burning biomass. So what are Drax and the government saying about it? Well, they've both very firmly defended biomass. Drax has said Ember's interpretation of the figures for Drax's CO2 emissions is inaccurate and completely at odds with what the world's leading climate scientists at the UN IPCC say about sustainable biomass being crucial to delivering global climate targets. They said that we have reduced our emissions by more than 90% in the last decade and Drax is now one of Europe's lowest carbon energy generators. And the business and energy department, they said much the same. They said, we do not recognise these figures. The UK government is committed to eliminating our contribution to climate change by 2050 and biomass is a key element of our plans to reach this target. So very firm there from both. And I should also just mention that separately, Drax is involved with a court case at the moment, which is unrelated. That's to do with the dust that comes from its wood pellets when they're handled in the factory and has nothing to do with the emissions when they're burned. So separate issues there, but in any case, difficult time for Drax. Victoria, thanks very much indeed.
Now, the UN Human Rights Council passed a resolution today recognising access to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a human right. Well, Dr David Boyd, who's the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, described the resolution as having life-changing potential, and he joins us now live. Uh, welcome to you. First of all, just how important do you consider this resolution to be? Well, this is really a historic moment. You know, it's not every day that the world recognizes a new human right. So this is a potentially life-saving, game-changing right, given the, face, given the fact that we face this triple-headed global environmental crisis of climate change, loss of biodiversity, and pervasive pollution. So you say it's potentially life-saving. How so? Well, because this resolution is a catalyst for changes in every country in the world. It should result in countries bringing in stronger environmental laws and policies, improving the implementation and enforcement of those laws and policies. And it gives people a very powerful tool. A human right is a tool that people can use to hold their governments accountable. You said it should see governments bringing in tighter laws. Is this legally binding? Do they have to do that? No, and I think that's important to be perfectly clear that this is not a legally binding or enforceable treaty. It's a resolution which is more, more akin to a political declaration. But as we saw in 2010 with the UN resolution that for the first time recognized the right to water, that was a catalyst for incredible changes at the national level. Countries changed their constitutions, they changed their legislation, and most importantly, they put a greater priority on delivering on that fundamental promise of the human right to safe water. A lot is talked about uh, in terms of timings when we're talking about cutting emissions and improving our environment. There isn't much time. How long do you think it could take before countries around the world recognise this and put it into law? Oh, I think this will start happening within the next year. I mean, that was the experience with the right to water resolution that I just mentioned, that it, it resulted in immediate changes to constitutions, legislation and practices on the ground. And given the urgency of the global environmental crisis, it's absolutely imperative that governments across the world uh, take higher ambition in terms of their climate action, in terms of their reducing pollution, in terms of protecting and conserving and restoring nature. And a human rights-based approach is the most powerful way that we can do that in an equitable and effective fashion. And very briefly, can you give us an example of how this might be applied? Absolutely. So, for example, the world is planning to uh, protect 30% of the Earth's lands and waters by 2030. But we have to do that from a rights-based perspective to make sure that we're not throwing people out of their homes in the process of creating new parks and protected areas, as we have in the past. So a rights-based approach, working with the people on the ground, has actually been proven to be more effective than traditional fortress styles of conservation. Same in the climate context, where we have rights-based climate action then we will make sure that we aren't doing things like protecting forests where people are living and preventing them from earning a livelihood in those forests. Dr David Boyd, thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much, Anna. Now, new research by WWF shows that fewer than one in five of the UK's top companies have published a detailed action plan to reduce their climate emissions to net zero. The conservation organisation told us the government won't be able to keep the UK's climate promises without legislation forcing big businesses to plan how they'll reach net zero by 2050. This report that shows us that only 19% of those top companies have got a clear plan for action. That's not enough. We need government to come forward to make sure that we have mandatory transition plans that align with the science. We've got the commitments. Let's make sure we've got credible plans in place that set those companies on the right trajectory, that get us on that race to zero and make sure that we that actually they deliver what they say they're going to deliver. I think some companies are being very brave in terms of moving forward. And some of this we're going to have to learn on the job for sure. But this is about the future of humanity. We've all got to step up. And I, it can't just be the PR department stepping up. It needs to make sure that this is going through the whole of business and that consumers can feel confident 
in those commitments that are going forward. We've all got to play our part. And actually, a lot of companies are crying out for this because the ones that are leading are saying, set a level playing field. Let's be transparent. We've got this transparency commitment that's coming forward in the next couple of years. But it's a bit like putting the calories on the box of your pizza. It doesn't really have any relation to whether you're going to eat it or your diet plan. They're two totally different things. And we need to have confidence in this system. To have greenwashing now would fundamentally undermine what we're all trying to achieve. In some of today's other climate news, Pope Francis will not attend COP26 in Glasgow. The Vatican has confirmed that its delegation to next month's UN Climate Change Conference will instead be headed by its Secretary of State. It had been hoped the Pope would attend after he held a pre-COP26 summit earlier this week. He joined 40 religious leaders in issuing a joint climate appeal to heads of state, asking for concrete solutions to save the planet from an unprecedented ecological crisis. A study has found a lack of diversity in climate change decision making. The year long study in Bristol, which was conducted by the city's university, found that voices of people from diverse backgrounds make up just 3% of discussions on climate change. Findings also revealed that white men spoke on average 64% of the time, while men from black, Asian, or ethnic minority backgrounds spoke for just 1% of the time. Daily meat consumption in the UK has fallen by 17% in the past decade, according to a study published in Lancet Planetary Health. But that reduction is not happening quickly enough to reduce the environmental impact of our diets. The National Food Strategy says meat consumption in the UK needs to fall by 30% over the next 10 years to meet sustainable farming goals. Marine mucilage, also known as sea snot, is causing problems for fishermen in Turkey's Sea of Marmara. It can cause nets to become entangled and break and is also susceptible to bacteria that can threaten marine environments. Scientists believe that the growth of sea snot is caused by rising sea temperatures and human-induced pollution. Do stay with us. Coming up after the break, I'll be joined by the founder of Climate in Colour, Joycelyn Longdon, and Bruce Nillis, the director of the climate think tank Climate Imperative. And we're going to be talking about the latest figures that indicate a lack of diversity in climate change policy making, and also if biomass should be viewed as a source of clean energy. That's coming up.
Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. Cercando as áreas, limpando as áreas e progressivamente avançando com os plantios. Isso daqui é uma sentença de morte para os manguezais. Did you know that driving us to school creates extra toxic air at drop-off and pick-up times? Overnight fog patches over central and southern England will gradually lift to warm sunshine. It'll be cloudier elsewhere with outbreaks of rain moving from Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic into Northern England and Wales. Skies will brighten later from the west over Ireland and northwest Scotland. Taking a look at the daily air quality index, where levels of air pollution are bandied from 1 being low to 10 being very high, air pollution levels will be low, but isolated pockets of moderate pollution are possible in urban areas. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. Hello and welcome back to the Daily Climate Show on Sky News. We're going to get straight to discussing the climate issues of the day now with the founder of Climate in Colour, Joyce Lynn Longdon, and Bruce Nillis, the Executive Director of Climate Imperative. So welcome to both of you. Good to see you both. So first of all, biomass power accounts for around 12% of the UK's electricity, making it the country's second largest source of renewable energy. The government says it's helped to dramatically reduce the UK's use of coal and is key to achieving net zero emissions. But some scientists argue that burning wood for power is not a sustainable solution. So should we view biomass as a clean energy source? Uh, Bruce, to you first of all, and let me just... Forgive me if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the theory behind biomass is that you harvest forests sustainably, then you burn the wood, but then if you also plant new trees, they will absorb roughly the same amount of carbon that's being released from the burning of the wood. And its advocates would say that makes it a clean, renewable energy source. What's your take? That was the state of the science a couple of decades ago. Today, the notion that we would cut down trees here in America, put them on a ship, burning a lot of oil, ship them to the UK, burn them in um, a giant power plant and assume that is helpful for the climate, that is not where the science is today. The science says we're in code red uh, situation for humanity. And even the prime minister has his tagline for how we solve the climate, coal, cars, cash and trees. He's not talking about burning trees, he's talking about planting trees, which is a critical part of what we need to do globally to solve the climate crisis. And so this is just an outdated holdover from when we didn't know better. But, but, but this does involve planting trees, doesn't it, to, to replace the carbon. So why is there a problem? Well, the two things, and you mentioned at the top of the hour. One is that it takes a long time for trees to grow back. Um, and then secondly, the energy involved in shipping them across the country, cutting them down in the first place, uh, it doesn't make any science-based sense to continue to do that when we're trying to get to zero as fast as humanly possible. And Joycelyn, the UK and the EU class biomass as renewable. And in fact, uh, just to remind us, the government does say that biomass is a key element of uh, plans to, to reach net zero targets. What, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I think I'd have to second what Bruce has said. Um, we need to really reconsider what we mean by sustainable. And uh, as the science has proved, this isn't really sustainable um, when trees are such an important part of our strategy to get to net zero. And I'm not a biofuel expert, but I think another important thing we need to keep in mind is that 
um, kind of at the same time as a climate crisis, we have a biodiversity crisis and planting trees just to be cut down again does nothing for our biodiversity, nothing for natural ecosystems, which are equally as important. And we can't just keep focusing on this net zero kind of calculation down to zero because it's not a true um, kind of signifier of our progress. Uh, Bruce, you, you don't think the biomass is uh, should be classed as a renewable uh, source of energy. What what technology might help you change your mind if there was the technology to capture the carbon released when the wood is burned? Would that make a big difference? And how far away are we from that? So, so as Jocelyn said, we're, we're trying to solve several crises at the same time. One is climate and the other is the ecological crisis. Um, we need trees for both, both to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and also to make sure there is homes for a lot of wildlife that's teetering on the edge of extinction. So again, this, this makes no sense. And um, the, the path forward is how do we phase out biomass now that the UK is very close to being done with coal? The path ahead is investing in offshore wind and solar and all the things that are allowing the country to make great progress on coal now to make the same progress on phasing out biomass. It'll be interesting to see how this argument uh, plays out um, on both sides. But let's move on to our next topic, shall we? Because as we heard earlier in the show, new research by the University of Bristol suggests climate change discussions are still dominated by white men. And it's something that environmentalists and campaign groups have come under fire for in the past. So is cl the climate change movement unrepresentative? And Joycelyn, this comes from a year-long study in Bristol, doesn't it? It found that uh, voices of ethnically diverse people make up just 3% of uh, discussions on climate change decision making. Uh, you have founded a company called uh, Climate in Colour. I think one of the things you're trying to do is try to make sure that conversations are more diverse. So are you surprised by this finding? No, of course not. I'm not surprised by this finding because the inequality that we see in other um, parts of life, other industries, is, is not um, any different in the climate space. But I think that uh, a key thing to keep in mind is where we are kind of looking at these discussions, because through my work, um, people of colour, women and people from marginalised communities are actually on the front line of these issues, on the front line of the effects of these issues, but also at the front line and leading um, action in many ways. So when we say that there's a lack of diversity in climate change discussions, I think we need to think about where those discussions are happening, because it seems like there's a huge uh, disparity between on the ground grassroots and frontline um, representation of marginalized communities and then um, sort of institutional, organizational and governmental conversations. Um, and I think there is where we see a, a huge issue. Bruce, what's the situation like in the States? Uh, it's exactly as you were describing um, in the UK, which is um, we have historically made a lot of decisions that are by a very small part of society. And we now know and, and we're seeing policies begin to put in place to actually address this. So in California, for example, recently a law was passed that no longer can the boards of corporations be all men and all white. <clears throat> and so how do we open up decision making? So as Jocelyn said, particularly for people who are the most affected, we will make better decisions um, and more durable decisions if we're involving the very people who are impacted by um, being on the front lines of this climate crisis. What do you make, Jocelyn, of steps like that? How do you think we should address this? Well, um, I think oh, there's a really important quote by Thomas Sankara, which I can paraphrase, but the inclusion of marginalised communities is not one that's out of charity. It's because it is a real necessary basis for our kind of triumph and success in overcoming the climate emergency. Um, these people are not just victims. They're not people that we have to include because of charity. They're actually so creative and so dedicated um, out of, in a lot of um, times, necess necessity. Um, so really our success will be built on the inclusion um, and it's, it is a necessity rather than a sort of charitable action. And Jocelyn, a very quick thought on COP26 coming up. How confident are you that a diverse range of voices will be heard there? I think um, that that will depend on which zone you're in. Um, I think the blue zone, not so much. Um, there are huge barriers um, from the UK Home Office and from vaccines and all of these um, different barriers, uh, financial barriers. 
Um, in the green zone, uh, there are a huge amount of events. Um, we've got COP26 coalition doing okay. such amazing work. So many activist groups are going to be there, and that's where the real diversity is going to stand out, in my opinion. OK, Joycelyn Longdon and Bruce Nillis, we must leave it there. We're out of time. Uh, good to see you both. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Do stay tuned with us uh, here on...